here we are part two if you haven't seen part one i recommend that you go watch that first though you don't have to that will contain all weapons that start with a through r if this is your first video of the two parts you've clicked on basically i rank every tf2 weapon then give a couple fun facts about each one sometimes stat history sometimes unused stuff just whatever i feel is interesting enough to share with you guys so with that let's start where we left off at the sandman out of february 24th 2009 the Sandman in its current state is kind of a joke. It isn't unusable or anything like that, but a 15 health penalty so you can effectively do 15 damage from a slight range is not worth it in most scenarios. The slowdown hardly ever does enough to help the scout actually secure a kill. D tier. Trivia. I put in D tier now, but the weapon was once the bane of existence for most TF2 players around its release. It had three stats. Alt fire, Launches a ball that stuns opponents. No, not slows down. Stuns. Not even like the Scream Fortress put into a scared animation and slowed. That wasn't until 2010. This weapon completely locked whoever was hit in place. What were the downsides for this massive upside? No double jump and a 50% damage penalty against stun players. The best part? It got patched the next day that removed the damage penalty. The Sandman was ridiculous on release. It doesn't even stop there. The Sandman was capable of stunning ubered enemies too. The saving grace for enemies was the fact that they had a 50% damage resistance when stunned, taking half damage from all sources, which was lowered to just 25% in 2009, August 2009. Though with that being said, the Sandman did receive its first nerfs. No longer stunned ubered players, which I don't even know why it could in the first place, that was a weird stat. I mean, it could be cool as like its own weapon, I guess. That's a completely different topic. And it also had its no double jump downside changed to a health penalty. 15? No, 30. When the health penalty was added, it took Scout's base health from 125 to just 95. In the war update, the stun mechanic would be changed to the one we're more familiar with, at least to most of us where it would put enemies into the fling animation and only full stun if you got a moonshot, which meant you had to hit him at very long range. January 6th of 2010 would be when the health penalty was changed to just 15, now bringing up the Sandman's health from 95 to 110. The weapon would stay like this for seven years before being absolutely decimated in the Jungle Inferno update, removing the stun mechanic and adding a slowing effect instead. It also changed some minor stats, but it, th that didn't help. And another cool fact with the Sandman, if another scout hits you with a Sandman ball below the belt, you'll automatically pick it up. The Sandwich, and on August 19th, 2008. S tier. For real though, this is Heavy's best utility item outside of maybe the second banana. There's very little reason not to run this if you are running a serious heavy loadout. Trivia. This one's got some history, but I'll list short facts for you instead. 1. The Sandwich originally only healed for 120 health rather than bringing you up to full. 2. The Sandwich used to not have a recharge mechanic, having to pick up health packs while at full HP in order to replenish. You can actually still do this now. 3. The Sandwich couldn't be dropped until a year later. When it was dropped, it acted as a medium health kit. And lastly, Drop sandwiches used to not allow you to pick them up, instead acting as a medium health pack for you. Some heavies would use this instead of taunting for a quick 150 health, which may be more beneficial than a 4 second animation to get back to full health. The Sapper, added October 10th, 2007. Spies, other Sapper, default one. The Sapper is just baseline for Spy. Without it, he wouldn't really be Spy. It works, does what it's supposed to, though unless the NG's dead, it's not all that effective, other than maybe shutting down the building for a second, which I guess could help your team move in on it. B tier. Trivia. 1. Spy's Revolver used to have a 66% damage penalty against sap buildings. This was lowered to 33% in gunmetal. 2. After removing a sapper from a sentry gun, there's now a 0.5 second delay before the sentry is active again, allowing the spy some time to react. Originally, the sentry gun would be active directly after the sapper was destroyed. So basically, as soon as the sapper was destroyed, the sentry gun could target the spy. 
which often left the spy, you know, dead. Three, the sapper used to spark and was broken off onto the ground when destroyed. Whereas now, in current day, it simply just disappears. The Scattergun, added October 10th, 2007. The Scattergun is Scout's best primary when it comes to consistency. It holds the most in its magazine clip thing. It does consistent damage, has a consistent fire rate. It's just all around a great shotgun for new, intermediate, and veteran players alike. You can't go wrong. A tier. Trivia. I brought this up in the Force of Nature section in part 1, but just to refresh, there is code in the game files named scatter underscore gun underscore double underscore shoot dot wav, suggesting that the scatter gun may have been planned to have a double barrel mechanic at some point. Maybe similar to the double barrel shotgun in TFC? I don't know. The sound file would eventually be repurposed and used with Force of Nature. The Scorch Shot. The Scorch Shot. Scorch Shot. Scorch Shot. Was unfortunately added June 27, 2012. Hate other people having fun? Use this item right here. It's guaranteed to piss off the entire other team when you inevitably spam this thing at snipers across the map, through choke points, and at objectives. Morally, this thing's F tier, bottom of the barrel. But, in reality, it's a B tier weapon. <laughs> Trivia. This weapon has always been kind of annoying since its inception. However, this weapon wasn't always powerful. At least, not as powerful. Yeah, the gunmetal update buffed this thing, giving it these new stats. They reduced the damage penalty from 50% to 35%. It now has increased knockback versus burning players. They increased the blast radius from 92 hammer units to 110 hammer units, which they also did to the detonator, but god, why'd you have to do it to the score shot too? That was a bad decision. And now hits and explosions always mini crit burning targets. That one right there. That one right there does it. The only thing they nerfed was reducing the blast force taken by 35% four days after the update. Because for a short time there was really no reason to run the detonator. Another fact, this is likely known by most players, but in case you don't, Taunt killing with the scorch shot only works up to about 400-ish hammer units. If the enemy is hit outside this range, the weapon will deal normal flare damage. And it uses an actual flare from your ammo pool. The Scotsman Skull Cutter, added May 10th, 2010. The Medieval Mode Melee. This thing is kinda ridiculous, but less annoying than something like the scorch shot. This weapon has a 20% damage bonus, which allows it to do 78 damage on hit. Which sounds like nothing to write home about, but this thing is capable of random critting. As you know, melee crits are a dime a dozen. This crit is despicable, capable of one-shotting soldiers even with the battalion's backup, as it does 234 damage. The Skullcutter isn't blatantly overpowered, but it can be cheap sometimes for sure. Its downside really does help balance this weapon out quite a bit though. B tier. Trivia. This one is straight from the TF2 wiki. There is an unused axe located in the backpack files that resembles the skull cutter. Based on the similar designs and file names, it may have been a prototype for the horseless headless horseman's head taker. 2. On release, the 15% movement speed penalty used to apply regardless if you had it out or not. It's Mismus 2014, this would be changed to only while active, which made it a little bit less of a pain to run in your loadout in general. The Scottish Resistance added December 17th, 2009. A must use for ambient players, unless you're one of those weird Demonite ambient players. In casual, this thing gets very little playtime. The Scottish Resistance whole shtick is the fact that it's a defense and trap oriented sticky bomb launcher, with its ability to place forging stickies and detonate stickies one at a time. Though, because more sticky bomb users are brain dead, including myself, it gets little use. Still a good weapon for what it's supposed to do, B tier. Trivia. 1. I was talking about this in the Sticky Jumper portion, but the Sticky Jumper's current Sticky Bomb model was actually planned for the Scottish Resistance. It was changed later for some reason. And to add on to that, the current Scottish Resistance Sticky Bomb wasn't the one planned right after the Sticky Jumper model. There was actually another model, this one. It's a normal Sticky Bomb, but with lots of spikes. This one was likely changed because it resembled stock too much. 3. The Scottish Resistance used to claim that it could place twice as many stickies, though as you know, 8x2 is 16. The Scottish Resistance can only place 14. So, 
sometime before the weapon was shipped, the number was reduced by two for some reason. And last, the Scottish Resistance used to have a 0.4 second slower arm time, which was doubled in 2010 to a 0.8 second slower time. It did receive a 25% faster firing speed in return. Second Banana, added October 20th, 2017. The second banana is actually pretty good. While it's hard to top the sandwich for its utility, the second banana gives it a run for its money. The faster recharge allows you to heal more over time. It's less useful for your medic, acting as a small health kit instead of a medium. But other than that, if you're a solo heavy, it isn't a bad idea to maybe swap out your beloved sandwich and give this one a try. A tier. Trivia. There's not much for this one because um, it hasn't been out for very long in the grand scheme of TF2, even though it's been out for six years. Despite claiming to recharge 50% faster, which means it should take 15 seconds to recharge, it actually recharges 66% faster as it only takes 10 seconds for the banana to complete its cooldown. The Shansha, added June 23rd, 2011. Uh, the Shahansha is in the game. It's a weapon with stats. You can, you can swing it and you can hurt people. I really don't know the point of it. It's a simple design, but it's kind of a stupid simple one. Over half health, less damage. Below half health, more damage. Nothing else. It's kind of the epitome of a C-tier weapon. Trivia. Besides being added to the game, this weapon has only had three updates of any kind. On June 28, 2011, they added a refine, recoil, draw, crit, reload forces, whatever that means. On March 12th, 2015, they added a strange variant, and finally on December 21st, 2017, they added a festivized variant. That's it. That is all the history for this weapon. The Sharpened Volcano Fragment added February 3rd, 2011. I forgot this axe existed. This weapon is just flawed in concept. It's cool looking, and it's not a bad idea on paper necessarily. Hey, Pyro's a fire class, what if we made him be able to... Light people on fire regardless of what weapon he was using. Let's have an axe that lights people on fire. But why would you need a melee to do what the flamethrower already does better? Especially if it offers no utility and the damage is piss poor, which the sharpened volcano fragment is. So overall, this weapon's a D tier weapon. Trivia. Along with the sun on a stick, this weapon was a promotional item for the game Rift. And in its original concept, it was meant to be an axe extinguisher reskin. Yeah which could have actually been better and a lot cooler than what we ended up getting. The Short Circuit, added August 18th, 2011. Hate soldiers and demo man constantly spamming rockets and pipes at your stuff? Use this item right here and just delete the goddamn things. This weapon's really odd. It's really worth using as the Wrangler exists, but it's not bad by any means. Very useful on stuff like Last Point and the end of Halo maps when there's a bunch of soldiers and demo mans shooting rockets, stickies, pills, cannonballs, whatever else at your stuff. But, personally, I can't find much utility for it. And Engineer mains may disagree with me, maybe they can find more use for it than I can, but overall it's a C-tier item. Trivia! This one's a history segment, so it's gonna be a long one, get ready. The short circuit, like the Pretty Boy's pocket pistol, mentioned in the last video, has gone through many changes, having a hard time finding its identity. When the weapon was released, it wasn't like what it is like today. It used to only have a primary fire, and that primary fire cost 35 metal, and would destroy any projectile that it hits with its projectile electrical field wall thing. You know what I'm talking about. If you're playing at the time, you know what I'm talking about. That was it. Very simple, very straightforward. It remained this way for a little while, until July 30th, 2013, when they made it cost 36 metal to fire, but if you actually destroyed a projectile, you would only lose 18 metal. They also slightly increased the firing speed by 25%. It would stay this way for about 5 months, until they did the unthinkable. Many players at the time may remember when this thing was absolutely ridiculous. The metal consumption was lowered to just 5, regardless if the projectile was deleted or not, so it was 5, always. And the attack speed was sped up immensely. It's the same as the current primary fire, but it could delete projectiles and it only cost 5. So this thing was just stupid spammable. That didn't last super long. By January 9th of 2014, the damage was lowered. It now consumed 15 metal per projectile, and for some reason it couldn't be fired underwater anymore. Not completely sure why that, but I guess it makes sense, but I don't know, it's kind of weird. It would stay like that for one year and some change. 
In Gunmetal, they changed the short circuit again, adding an alt fire that cost 15 metal and had a 0.5 second cooldown. The primary fire now does what it does currently, just being a small electrical beam that really doesn't do anything. Finally, the short circuit can rest. Not so fast. Another year later, it was changed again. The base secondary now costs 10 metal regardless, but lost an additional 5 metal for every projectile that was destroyed by its electrical field. In addition, you could no longer pick up buildings while the short circuit was deployed. This is still a stat today, by the way. Thankfully, the constant sway of rebalances and changes would end on March 28th, 2018. This is when we would get the energy orb that costs 65 metal and destroys every projectile near it. You get some small bug fixes, but overall, it's the same as we have now. Long history. One extra fact for you guys, the short circuit has a 90% damage penalty against buildings. I believe it's listed at exactly 93%. That is completely omitted from the stat line. The shortstop, added September 30th, 2010. I talked a little about this weapon back in part one. Well, specifically the set it was in, this was the primary for the Milkman set, which granted scouts 25 extra health at one time. That's the past though. Currently, this weapon is a little bit overlooked because of the soda poppers insane damage and the scattergun's general usability. But the shortstop offers the ability to take people out from a slightly further range. Scout is usually up in people's business, but this thing takes a different approach. Instead of being more accurate, allowing for easier pickoffs. Not bad by any means. Plus it has the shove mechanic, which is cool. Not really. B tier. Trivia. One. The shortstop used to have a ridiculous reload speed, being similar to the pistol at the time. It was lowered by a whole 50%, and the shortstop still reloads decently quickly. So you could easily imagine how fast it was. In fact, I probably put a video on screen so you don't have to imagine, but yeah, it was pretty fast. Two, many of you likely already know, it didn't release with this bonus, but July 10, 2013, this thing used to offer 20% bonus health from health packs before being changed to the shove mechanic we have now. Great trade-off. Three, the shortstop used to offer a knockback penalty. It always has. However, it's been half twice starting at 80%, which meant you were flung across the map by anything. Then it was lowered to 40% for a while, before being lowered to 20% in meager match. 4. The shortstop used to take from your secondary ammo rather than your primary ammo. The reason for this is probably because the COP 357 Derringer this weapon is based on, you know, is a pistol. Though Valve likely realized this is a fictional game and they can do whatever they wanted, so they made it have its own ammo supply. Even in the old concept art for this weapon, it looks similar to the real-life counterpart. Put a picture of that on screen. Yeah, pretty neat. The Shotgun, added October 10th, 2007. The Shotgun is TF2's bread and butter. It is one of the few games to do shotguns right. It feels powerful, but isn't blatantly overpowered in any way. Taking two shots for lighter gear and medium classes, three for soldiers, and four for heavies. The shotgun is often thrown out in favor of other items pretty quickly, and for the heavy it does kind of make sense, but with the other three classes, NG, Pyro, and Soldier, I actually find myself coming back to the shotgun a lot because of its reliability. B tier. Trivia. For all classes, before September 30th, 2010, they had a slightly different reload speed. Heavy even had a completely different reload animation. This was standardized to get rid of any variance between the classes using their shotguns. And then specifically for Soldier, the current buff banner Juggle Taunt used to be the taunt for the shotgun, until the shotgun received a new taunt in the war update of 2009. The Shovel, added October 10th, 2007. Why even use this? D tier. Trivia. There, there is none. Besides, I guess for a short time it couldn't destroy sticky bombs, but I think that was just a bug. The Sniper Rifle, out of October 10th, 2007. This is the one that started it all. Being happy, running around using your projectile-based weapon, and then half a second later, you're in the respawn machine. This weapon is objectively good in my opinion, and it actually really isn't all that overpowered. It's just really annoying to fight a sniper who's really good and never seems to miss heads. It's Sometimes it's ridiculous, honestly. But overall, this weapon is an A tier for me, but it would be understandable that some might find this as an S tier weapon. Trivia. 
This weapon stayed mostly unchanged. There have only been three things to note about this weapon. In the video TF2 2007 versus Now, it is displayed that the sniper shell casing is ejected in front of you on the left side of your gun. But originally, in 2007, it was displayed on the right side, away from you. Technically, the 2007 version makes more sense logistically, but the current day version is actually correct since the sniper uses a rifle with a left-handed ejection port. 2. The sniper was given a 200 millisecond or 0 0.02 seconds, excuse me, 0 0.2 seconds delay before being able to headshot after scoping in February of 2008. And lastly, until 2011, the sniper lacked a distinct fully charged bell sound. The Soda Popper, added June 23rd, 2011. The Soda Popper is often considered Scout's best scattergun for dealing damage at quick bursts. They are correct. This thing offers a 50% firing speed bonus, has minimal knockback, so it's not like the Force of Nature where it's going to shoot your target across the map, and it doesn't have a damage penalty. Sure, it only has two shots, but you could do up to 208 damage in rapid succession. And this weapon offers a 25% reload speed bonus, so it's ready quite quickly. Then you have an extra 5 jumps on top of that, it's insane, this weapon is phenomenal. Depending on who's using it, it could either be better, or about the same as the scattergun. For me, it's a low S tier weapon. Trivia. When this thing was released, in the, you guessed it, Uber update, it worked a little bit differently. You may have noticed the Criticola strap to the bottom. Yeah. This weapon, when fully charged, used to grant you 8 full seconds of mini crits. The best part? The height meter used to charge by just running around. Now, when the weapon released, it would automatically activate upon filling the meter, but this could easily be bypassed by pulling out your secondary or melee right before it's full, and then pulling out your primary when it's ready to use. And it did insane damage. It wasn't until to December of 2013 that the weapon was changed to pretty much what it is now, with the 5 extra air jumps instead of mini crits and the ability to activate at your leisure when the meter is full, using your alt attack key, whatever that is, find it for you. The only thing that has changed since then is it still had the mechanic where running around the map would fill the meter, or, as I should say, running around spawn, as most scouts did. It was in the Meet Your Match update of 2016 that the weapon was changed to needing to deal damage in order to fill the meter instead. 350 damage to be precise. Also some other interesting little details I might as well add on to the end. Because this thing used to mini crit, it had a no random crit attribute added. Though in February of 2014 it was silently changed to allow for random crits again. So there was a short period where it still had the 5 extra jumps but also didn't have the ability to random crit. So, I mean, it, with it or without it, it doesn't really matter. And finally, this one's unconfirmed, but I'm going to uh, tell you anyway. According to the wiki, early concepts of the soda popper had a bonk can strapped beneath the weapon instead of a Criticola can. You could kind of vaguely see this in the concept art, though I'm not 100% sure. I was unable to find any concrete evidence, so take this with a grain of salt. All the stuff I said before that, starting at the no random crits and before, is 100% true though. The Solemn Vow, added June 23rd, 2011. The Solemn Vow is the only other melee that medics may run. It has a passive upside and has great utility, offering the ability to see enemies' health, which is just a great tool, especially if your team does callouts, if you're a competitive player. It's hard to put down the Uber Saw since it's practically glued to most medics' hands at this point, though it is a great alternative, A tier. Trivia. Along with the third degree and early amputator, the Solemn Vow had no downsides when it released. It wasn't until Gunmetal of 2015 that it received a downside, absolutely decimating this weapon. They added a 10% swing speed penalty to a weapon with a passive bonus. Yeah, it was just so the weapon had some red text. It wasn't a real downside. The Southern Hospitality, added July 8th, 2010. This wrench exists. It doesn't do much, but it exists. It offers the niche ability to detect spies, but even that isn't great since health kits remove bleed and spies cloak reduces the duration to approximately two and a half seconds. 
so you better find them quickly. As many people say, you're better off using the stock wrench or something and just hoping for a random crit. So, C tier. Trivia. This weapon has gone completely unchanged. The only time it had a stat change was for a short time of one whole day during the Hatless update where it, as well as every other weapon that has the no random crit penalty, was changed to a 25% damage penalty. The Southern Hospitality could crit for one whole day. It was reverted quickly along with every single weapon that had this change besides the power jack. The Splendid Screen, at its June 23rd, 2011. The main demonized shield, at least nowadays. This item offers decent resistances, a fast recharge, crits, increased shield bash damage, all you would want for Demonite. Sure, the other shields work for Demonite, of course, though if your goal is to do a ton of damage as Demonite, this is usually the one to run. A tier. Trivia. Nothing groundbreaking. But, the Splendid Screen used to have a staggering 5% additional resistance to fire compared to now. Having a 25% fire resistance. Before being lowered to 20% like the explosive resistance is. 2. In addition, the Shield Bash was the main draw. However, I would say now one of the main draws is the increased recharge rate. On release, the Splendid Screen lacked this recharge bonus. And last, it's pretty well known, but if you're like me, you may be oblivious, the Splendid Screen does have other styles, one with a spike and one with an arrow and a spike. The Spicicle, added December 15th, 2011. The Spicicle is not a bad melee. The Icicle is good for countering pyros, which we know can be a real pain. It isn't technically exclusively for countering pyros, but there's not many other things that can light you on fire. That's what most of the upsides do. Uh, but it's still a good knife overall. It does its job well. A tier. Trivia. Currently, the Spicicle offers 1 second of immunity to fire after being touched, and 10 seconds of afterburn immunity. Though it originally was 2 seconds of fire immunity, period. 2. The Spicicle used to be a silent killer for some reason, meaning it didn't pop up in the enemy's kill feed. The Eternal Reward actually still works this way. And last, the Spicicle used to recharge naturally. It was it had to. Now it can be shortened by picking up ammo packs. I guess there's ice trays in there or something. I have no idea. The Sticky Bomb Launcher, at October 10th, 2007, with the release of the game. There is a weapon in the game specifically designed to spam Sticky Bombs, and this one does it better. It does it all. Spam, set traps, use intelligently by like one person and all of TF2. Sticky Bomb Launcher is just so versatile, it's unreal. This is no doubt one of the best weapons in the game, period. A tier. Trivia. Unlike many stock weapons, the Sticky Bomb Launcher has gone through many changes. Its first change came in February 2008 when the reserve ammo for the Sticky Bomb Launcher was reduced from 40 to just 24. Unlike the rocket launcher, this was kept and never touched again. If you don't know what I'm referring to, I'm referring to something I said in part one. Apologize for that. The sticky bombs themselves have also gone through numerous changes. The ramp up, similar to rockets, now where the closer you are to the projectile, the more damage it will do. Rather than the closer the enemy is to the projectile, the more damage it will do. This ultimately reduces how much damage the sticky bomb is actually capable of. For a short time after the Love and War update of 2014, there was a 2 second wait time for stickies to fully ramp up in damage, though this was reverted within a week. Then there was a whole heap of changes during the Smith Smith's 2014 patch, one that really doesn't apply anymore since most servers turn this off by default and Valve's official servers do as well, is that random damage spread was changed from a plus minus 10% variance to a plus minus 2% variance. Though I thought I'd mention it even though most of the time this isn't going to matter. The sticky bombs were also given a new ramp up system. When they're in the air they will start at 85% the normal sticky bomb explosion radius. If the sticky bomb exists for two full seconds or touches the ground the radius will be increased to 100% what it is normally. Though while this is true the radius of the sticky bomb along with the grenade launcher's explosions were reduced in this update to that of what the rocket is from 159 hammer units to 146 hammer units. Also some small bug fixes from there, but nothing major. Here's some extra small facts. One, 
The Sticky Bomb launcher used to be in the primary spot for Demo Man's loadout, so it really is true that the Demo Man has two primaries. 2. In the beta, the Sticky Bomb launcher was supposed to be more like it is in TFC. Not sticky, instead rolling, just being a detonating grenade. We can see this in the second 2006 TF2 beta trailer. The Sticky Bomb launcher's original model would end up being used for the regular grenade launcher. Though, there is a chance that this model was used for both the regular grenade launcher and the Sticky Bomb launcher. As in TFC, the Sticky Bomb launcher and grenade launcher used the same weapon model, with the difference being whether or not the little scope iron sights were up. And also, the Sticky Bomb launcher would have probably held 6 like it does in TFC. Though, I don't know. And last, a little fact that cop straight from the wiki, Sticky Bombs are fired at approximately 34 miles per hour and when converted to kilometers per hour, that's about 55. The SMG, added October 10th, 2007. The SMG is very underutilized, but I can't say it's not for a good reason. The SMG does piss poor damage, and the sniper already has other options such as Gerardi and the Cozy Camper. What about spies and up close encounters? In that scenario, the Kukri or even a nice little body shot from your rifle is likely to be more effective. This weapon is a very low C tier weapon. Trivia. There isn't anything all that interesting. The only thing to note is that in the beta, the SMG was actually meant to be used by scouts before he was given the nail gun and eventually the scatter gun. And for a short while, it was even considered being for medic, though it would be given to the sniper as a secondary eventually. Also, according to the TF2 wiki, the SMG may have worked more like the nail gun in Team Fortress Classic before being changed to a hitscan bullet based weapon. The Sama Stick, added February 3rd, 2011. Just like the Sharpened Volcano Fragment, this weapon is just not good. It is so niche and rarely ever worth using. If you don't have a Pyro on your team or a Kalmingler Soldier, one of the main draws of this weapon is obsolete. It works in the reverse as well. If there's no Pyro or Kalmingler Soldier on the other team, the other upside is obsolete. If there's neither, the weapon is a straight downgrade. It's not all that good. D tier. Trivia. Like the Sharpened Volcano Fragment, it is a promotional item for the game Rift. Mentioned in the Sharpened Volcano Fragment portion, both these weapons were intended to be reskins of normal weapons that are already in the game. The Sun on a Stick would have been the Boston Bashers reskin. 3. This weapon was quite odd and has quite a weird history. And it's for the most part worse than it is now. The original stats were kind of weird. After it was changed from the Boston Basher reskin, the original stats were a 35% damage bonus with the downside of a 45% damage penalty against non-burning enemies. Buildings would have increased damage done to them. This made the base damage 26 and 47 against burning enemies, which is lower than the current 78. Though, the damage bonus didn't take into account critical hits, so if you managed to crit versus a burning enemy, the Sun on a Stick could deal up to 142 damage. This was changed on February 7th. On February 7th, the weapon was changed to 100% mini crit versus burning enemies. Though now it had a 15% damage penalty. The base damage was up by 4 from 26 to 30, but would now deal 41 damage versus burning enemies, 90 if you managed to crit. In the Hatless update of 2011, it was changed to pretty much what it is now, dealing crits versus burning enemies for a 25% damage penalty, period. The base damage is now 26 again, and the crit damage is 78. Though, it wouldn't be until Meet Your Match in 2016 that it would get its fire resistance while active bonus. The Sydney Sleeper, added September 30th, 2010. The original King of Body Shot Weapons. This weapon is a sad case, it has a good concept being a support weapon, but it's just done wrong. It being a sniper rifle makes absolutely no sense. Why not use something that will kill someone outright instead of marking an enemy for your team to kill that might not even get killed? It suffers from the same fate as the Fan of War in Casual. You're 90% of the way there, why not just finish the job? This weapon has some utility in game modes like Carrier or MVM, but in Casual, it is a handicap most of the time. C tier. Trivia. A history segment back to back. This one is super odd. One, you may remember me just about 10, 20 seconds ago talking about how it made no sense that it's a sniper rifle. Well, in concept, it was actually an SMG variant. This would have been really cool, but would have probably overshadowed the Gerardi immensely. This is likely why it was changed to a rifle instead, which kind of killed it. This, this, the Sydney Sleeper isn't necessarily terrible, but you know what I mean by that. Two, when it was added to the game, it was a bit weird. It could randomly crit, 
had the ability to penetrate enemies, could cover invulnerable enemies in Jurati for some reason. It had no headshot capability, which is why it cemented itself as the body shot king at first. It didn't have the faster charge rate, and that wasn't added for nearly a year. In addition, rather than having a scaling system like it does now, it was kind of all or nothing. Not every scope shot applied Jurati, but when it did, it applied for the full 8 seconds. This was changed in the gunmetal update of 2015 to scaling from 2 to 8 seconds. It would be in the Meet Your Match update that the Sydney Sleeper got the ability to extinguish enemies, and it also got the ability to headshot. Sort of. Currently, the Sydney Sleeper will mini crit on headshot. However, originally, if you made a headshot or a fully charged shot, the Sydney Sleeper would apply Gerardi in a radius. This mechanic was completely removed in the Blue Moon update of 2018. In addition, the max duration was reduced from 8 to 5, though the minimum duration is still 2 seconds. It would receive the ability to mini crit on headshot though, which is kinda cool. As well as reducing your Jurati cooldown for one second, I don't really know why. That's pretty much what we have now. And another little mini fact add on top of it, the Sydney Sleeper lacked a blue skin for 12 years until it was returned in September of 2022. The Syringe Gun, added on October 10th, 2007. The Syringe Gun is just bad. Hard to aim projectile, mediocre damage at best, no utility, and it isn't the crossbow. D tier. Trivia. Apparently, the Syringe Gun in the game files is called the Super SMG. This is likely somewhat of a holdover from Team Fortress Classic where the medic used a weapon called the Super Nail Gun, while other classes used the standard nail gun. The SMG is a nail gun equivalent, even rumored to basically be the nail gun pointed over to TF2 in early builds, so it kind of makes sense. And second, before the major lighting and shader overhaul in early TF2's life, the syringe gun's cylinder used to spin just like the Spy's revolver cylinder. The Thermal Thruster, added October 20th of 2017. The Thermal Thruster is... Fine. It can allow you to get quickly from place to place, or up on high ledges the detonator can't get you to. It has a good utility, though because it's unable to deal damage effectively, you become reliant on your flamethrower. If you're a brain rot pyro that didn't even know you had a secondary or all fire, it's not that bad, but it's definitely a risk reward scenario. It's not super high risk or super high reward, it's just okay. C tier. Trivia. Besides some bug changes, the only stat change it had was several years ago. On release not listed in the stats, it had 120% slower holster speed than any other secondary, meaning it took 1.1 second to put it away. This was changed to 0.8 seconds, effectively 60% slower. The third degree. The fire axe, but with an upside that hardly ever comes into play or matters. Low D tier. Trivia. The third degree is the only current weapon in the game to be a direct upgrade from stock with no strings attached. There are some weapons that are technically straight upgrades that you can make a case for, but this one actually has the blue text to back it up. The Tide Turner, added June 18th, 2014. The Tide Turner as it is now is a fine shield. While offering the least resistances out of the Trinity, it does offer a great mobility options with its full turn control stat. Whether you're a traditional demo knight wanting to do cool tripping tricks or a hybrid knight, who wants some resistance, but wants a shield that's more likely to get him out of danger. It's a great shield overall. A tier. Trivia. This thing was quite ridiculous when it was added to the game. Originally, this thing was capable of critting just like every other shield. This was absolutely busted as when it was added, it lacked the damage reduction shield time stat. Full turn control plus crits plus a reasonable amount of resistance. It was just too much. In Smithmas 2014, they reduced the amount of charge back on kill from 100% to 75%, but more importantly, they added the damage reduces charge. Though, when this stat was originally added, it used to be a 3 to 1 shield time loss to damage ratio. This meant that it only took a pistol shot to nearly deplete your whole shield. 33 total damage to get rid of all of it. They tried to fix it up a little bit by having fall damage and self damage no longer take away from shield time, they added that a couple months later, but this didn't do anything. It would be in, finally in the Tough Break update that the resistances were reduced by 10% each, down to 15%, though the shield loss percentage to damage ratio was made 1 to 1, so 
So basically it takes 100 damage to deplete all of the shield. Though obviously with the charge time included, it, it's a little bit lower than that, but you get what I mean. And the Tide Turner couldn't crit anymore, instead dealing mini crits. In its current state, it's not all too bad. Svetlana, aka the Tommy Slav, added June 23rd, 2011. Often pondered whether this thing is a straight upgrade to stock. At one time it was, but we'll get to that. Currently, the Tommy Slav effectively offers a faster spin up for a slightly slower firing speed and a little bit more accuracy. The Tommy Slav is a great option if you just don't feel like running the regular minigun anymore. A tier. Trivia. As many of you are aware, it has always had a faster spin up speed, though it used to be absolutely stupid. Currently, the Tommy Slav sits at a comfortable 20% faster spin up speed, which is respectable. Though, when this thing came out during the Uber update, it had an astounding 75% spin up speed, though it lacked the accuracy bonus. This made it near instant. It would be on the 28th of that same month and year that Valve would notice and tone it down to just 40%. This was still really good and made it an excellent pick over the miniguns overall. It would stay like this for about a year until the Pyromania update in 2012, where the 40% faster spin up was reduced to just 10%. It this ended the reign of terror for the Tommy Slav. Remember, at the time, it still did not have the accuracy bonus, so it was 10% faster silent spin-up for a 20% slower firing speed, usually not worth it. It wouldn't be until the Gun Medal of 2015 that the weapon finally would be given a buff, increasing the spin speed from 10% to 20%, and adding a nice little 20% accuracy bonus as well. Extra fun fact, Tommy Slob used to have a different model in its early stages, looking like this, fully rendered, and this in the concept art. The Troutman Shiv added May 20th, 2010. The Troutman Shiv is a sad case. It sounds good on paper, but often falls short. The damage is pitiful, and the bleed is hardly ever enough to save this weapon. Low C tier. Trivia. Currently, the bleed lasts for 6 seconds, and the machete itself has a 50% damage penalty. This makes the max damage with no resistances 81. On release, however, the bleed lasted 8 seconds and the machete only had a 35% damage penalty. This made its max damage about 110. But with random damage spread, it was capable of theoretically doing 127 damage. This was beyond unlikely as you would need to roll both max damage for the machete swing as well as for each individual bleed tick. You could expect this thing to deal about 100 to 115 damage on average, assuming they picked up no health packs and had no resistances. The Uber Saw, added April 29th, 2008. The OG Medic Melee Unlock, and the only Medic Melee consistently ran for the last 15 years. The Uber Saw doesn't really even need to be talked about. The only other Melee that you can sometimes make a case for that might be better than the Uber Saw, like I said in some cases, is the Saw and Bow, and even then the stars align more often than that happens. The 25% Uber on hit for a 20% slower firing speed is just too hard to pass up in most scenarios. So it's obvious where this is going, S tier. Trivia. While the Uber Saw has remained unchanged since its addition to the game, it did have some new versions tested in the TF2's closed beta that had some downsides, new downsides, apart from the 20% slower firing speed. One included just having a damage penalty on top of it, Though, actually, I'm not too sure if this would have replaced the swing speed penalty or not. It seems like it would have just been an addition, so that's what I'm going with, though I'm not 100% sure. Another version that was tested was where, upon a successful hit, 25 health would be taken. So, if you hit, I don't know, a scout or a heavy or whatever, you would lose 25 health. I mean, pretty self-explanatory, but just in case. Obviously, neither of these were added to the game. The Whirlpool Caver, added December 17th, 2010. Going from the Market Gardener for demo to becoming a meme weapon that most people run when they get bored using the Islander. The Whirlpool Caver is terrible. The damage is unable to one-shot light classes consistently, though it technically can. And it damages you in the process. Don't even get me started on the swing speed and deploy speed penalties. Those are just... God. 
Though, I guess one neat thing about the Oolpool Caber is that if you use it with a charge and charge or a splendid screen and get a crit, it is capable of one tapping heavies without overheal. But even with that, D tier. Trivia. This weapon inconsistently one-shotting light classes is a problem now, but this thing used to be a medic deleter. The explosions plus melee hit itself could easily do enough damage to kill medics. Though in the gunmetal update, the ramp up was reduced and the base explosion damage was reduced from 100 to 75, which meant it could no longer one hit medics anymore. It was okay from here until they added the 20% slower firing speed and 100% slower deploying tough break, killing this weapon and cementing it as the funny meme weapon that sucks rather than the funny meme weapon that is annoyingly effective. Though the base damage of the caber was increased from 35 to 55 to compensate a little, but that didn't do much. The Vaccinator, out of December 20th, 2012. The Vaccinator is such a weird medigun. I know it can be really good, as I've fought against it many times, but I don't think I've actually used it in years. This gameplay footage I'm using right now? Man, this is like the first time I've equipped it since, I don't know, maybe 2018? So, it's hard to give a proper opinion on it. It's It has a decent learning curve compared to the other mediguns, and it works quite differently, but based on having fought against this thing, I have to put it in the S tier. It's just really, really good. Sure, it may be tough for new medics to get good use out of it, but medic who knows what he's doing? Oh my god. It is really, really difficult to find him. Trivia. Unfortunately, this trivia is going to be a bit less interesting due to my lack of experience with it. Though, when the vaccinator came out, it didn't have its crit resistance it has now when you activate the Uber Charge with the same ammo type that the crit is coming from. Meaning, if you have the explosive resistance on, and a crocket comes out of nowhere and hits you during your uber, it will have decreased damage. However, the vaccinator for a short period of time was overpowered to the extreme. The vaccinator's ability to resist crits used to apply just to the person you were healing regardless of whether the uber was active or not. Like I said, it didn't come out with this stat, but when it was added, that's how it worked and it was quite ridiculous. This was extremely annoying, especially for snipers since a headshot is simply just a crit and not its own value. Every sniper did body shot damage based on its charge. So at most, you could do 150 damage to somebody who was being pocketed by a vaccinated medic. This was changed alongside this laundry list of changes, the gunmetal update. So if you're interested in seeing what all that is, I'll put it up on screen, take time to pause, but we're moving on. The Vitasaw, added September 30th, 2010. The Vitasaw is a weird case. Currently, it isn't bad by any means, and can be especially useful against a team that isn't all that great and just lets you poke them a few times. The problem is that the Ubersaw exists, and that thing... Ugh, man. It's just... I hate to compare it to the Ubersaw, but it's it's true. The Ubersaw is just so hard to give up. Plus, the Vitasaw low-key kind of promotes dying. It was even worse on its inception, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Don't worry. I didn't forget. The Vitasaw is okay. A good melee. But like I said, it's not the Ubersaw. C tier. Trivia. In November 2010, the Vitasaw was given a new taunt sound. That of the old Ubersaw taunt sound. I forgot to mention this in the Ubersaw section, but yeah, before the Ubersaw's Uber Slice taunt was added, it used to be based off the Bone Saw's taunt, but had a deeper violin sound. When the Ubersaw received the new taunt, the Vitasaw was given the old taunt sound. Here, have a listen. Remember how I said this thing promotes dying? Well, as some of you may remember, before it had its organ system, it used to make it where you could store up to 20% of your uber from your previous life for just having it equipped. That's that's it. For 10 less health, you could just equip this thing and save up to 20% of your uber from your previous life. So if you died at 50%, you get to keep 20% of it when you respawn. It was a definite crutch. And last, similar to the Cow Mangler 5000, there are rumors of a painted Vitasaw existing somewhere in the TF2 realm. Unlike the Cow Manglers, it isn't completely known whether it's true or not, as there's no actual footage of it, at least none that I could find. The Warrior Spirit, added December 17th, 2010. 
It's cool that this thing does the most base damage of any melee weapon in the game, 85 to players, 84 buildings, and 115 when paired with the stake doing mini crits. Not counting the uh, Ool Pool Caber, which technically can do more damage, but only once, and then the base damage goes down to 55. While this is the case, this weapon is just kind of bad. It was part of the Hibernating Bear set, and included in that set was the Brass Beast, Buffalo Stake, and the Big Chief Cosmetic. Despite the fact that these weapons have little to no synergy, the set as a whole was just not great. The Warrior Spirit is just too much of a risk for a minute reward. D tier. Trivia. Wearing the original Hibernating Bear set, back when set bonuses were a thing, would grant a heavy... what was it? 5% crit resistance on wear. Did this... did this really do anything? I think it allowed you to survive a fully charged headshot at full overheal, but oh wait. No it didn't, because guess what? This brings us into the second point. The Warrior Spirit original stats were 30% damage bonus for 20 less health on wear, bringing the heavy's base health to 280. This made it where its max overheal was 420, and a fully charged headshot could still do 428 damage. So this set bonus was just stupid. Point number three. It wasn't until Gunmetal that they added the 10 HP stat on hit, which was quickly changed in the top break update only 5 months later to 50 HP on kill. And also in the tough break update, they removed the health penalty and added a 30% damage vulnerability. This kind of sounds like a good thing, as you don't have to risk just your, your, your health, right? You don't have to risk having a lower health pool for just having this thing on you. But here's the, here's the glaring issue. The Warrior Spirit is meant to be used with the Buffalo Stake. They're in the same set after all. When you originally used the Buffalo Stake, you would take mini crits on top of having 280 HP. This made your effective health 182. However, now the stake only makes you take 20% more damage, however with a 30% damage vulnerability on top of it. This makes your effective health 168. While yes, falloff does come into play, and if you're getting peppered from afar, you're more likely to survive, but your effective health is still 14 lower than it previously was, and that previous number was still really low. It was even worse for a while when the Buffalo Stake had a 25% damage vulnerability, giving you effectively 10 less health at 158, but overall the Warrior Spirit is just, it has bad synergy with the, all the items in its set, and its downside is just a bit too harsh for justifying using it most of the time. It technically isn't bad always, being quite decent in medieval mode, but still, it's just not that great. The Widowmaker, added August 18th, 2011. The Widowmaker is an interesting design for a shotgun. Using your metal supply for ammo is a neat concept, plus the risk reward of losing metal versus net gaining metal is a fun dynamic. The Widowmaker can definitely be used effectively for continuing assault against whoever it is you're in combat with, and not having to reload is a great bonus. It's overall a good weapon, B tier. Trivia. First, the Widowmaker is a promotional item received for pre-ordering a game called Deuce X Human Revolution in August of 2011. The Widowmaker is based on the shotgun from that game. The only thing that's missing is the little hand grip near the front of the barrel. Second, when the Widowmaker was released, it lacked the risk reward dynamic that it has now, and it was just a risk. The metal return on hit was still up to 60, though cost per shot used to be 60, so at best you could break even. This was changed to just 30 in October of 2011. The Winger, added June 23rd, 2011. Yeah, the Uber update, of course. The Winger is a utility item meant to be used for either finishing enemies off, or used to scale slightly higher ledges and cavities with the jump height bonus. Personally, I don't see the Winger used all that much, but it isn't bad. Rather situational with a far less immediate use. C tier. Trivia. The Winger didn't actually come out with the plus 25% jump height bonus. That was added in July of 2013. The original draw of this weapon was the damage bonus. That's it, that was the original point of this weapon. Though it didn't get much use then. Also, here's some cool concept art. I don't really have much to say about it. It would have had a slightly different design, I guess. Okay, cool. The Wrangler, at July 8th, 2010. Oh man. The Wrangler is one of only three engineer secondary options. Though, even if engineers could use any other class of secondary, this one would likely be near the top, if not the most used. 
Having control of your sentry with increased firing speed and a damage shield is just insane and it's hard to pass up. Obvious S tier. Trivia. The Wrangler has had a long history, a decently long one at least. Though it could be summed up in a few words. What were they thinking? It originally had a better accuracy at range, no damage fall off outside of the sentry's range, and could be repaired at the normal rate even if they had a protective shield up. It was reduced by 66% later on. Though it did get one buff, technically, rather a revert. From 2013 to 2015, the Wrangler's shield would only take one second to disappear after an engineer's death, before being changed to the normal three seconds again in gunmetal. There have also been some other small changes, such as how damage should ramp up and fall off work, rather being tied to the Sentry rather than the engineer as it originally was, but that's pretty much the gist of it. Bonus trivia. First, a level 3 Wrangled Sentry has effectively 359 health. Two, I mentioned this in the Gunslinger portion back in part 1, but the Wrangler was involved in helping you build level 3 mini sentries. Twice. This, this happened twice. And last, when the Wrangler was added, there was a weird bug that allowed you to team kill. If you shot rockets at a teammate with the Wrangler and quickly destroyed the sentry via destruction PDA, so it's a very quick sleight of hand, you could kill teammates, even on servers without friendly fire. Likely had to do something with the rockets no longer being tied to a team because the sentry was destroyed, but honestly, I don't know. Here's a clip of it in action, made by Richard Bobo. Okay, so I completely forgot about this weapon until just now. It is currently 6.29 p.m. on December 29, 2023. And yeah, I did not catch this weapon before. I thought I got it, but uh, apparently I didn't. Thank God I caught it right before the video was actually published. So we are doing the Eureka Effect. Yeah, the Eureka Effect, which was added on December 15, 2011. The Eureka Effect is such a weird item, it has some cool play to it, being able to engineer behind the enemy team and get out of dodge in a pinch. The only problem is, is that its ability is niche and is often not worth using over something like the Jag, Stock Wrench, Gunslinger, or even the Southern Hospitality sometimes. Overall this is a C tier wrench. Trivia. This wrench right here has had a very strange history to say the least. When it was added, it only had two stats. Alt fire teleport spawn for the downside of being unable to pick up your buildings. That's it. And no, I'm not actually forgetting anything. The ability to teleport to your exit teleporter wouldn't be added for nearly three years. It was finally added July 2014. In that update, it also got the ability to pick up buildings, though it had some new downsides to replace it. The downsides they added? Repair and upgrade rates have been decreased by 50%. Yeah. This meant you had to use double the metal to upgrade and repair buildings. You could just teleport to spawn and pick up some ammo, but this took a long time and made it setting up just kind of a hassle. In Gunmetal, they would change it once again, all the previous downsides were removed, and they made it where the construction hit speed boost was decreased by 50%, as well as a 50% less ammo from pickups and dispensers. This meant you didn't have to keep running to pick up ammo, but it took forever to set up. It still had the same problem. In the Meteor Match update, the Eureka effect would be changed one last time. For the better overall, the 50% less metal from dispensers and pickups was lowered to just 20%, as well as adding the, a new teleporter's cost 50% less stat. This was the same update that reduced the teleporter cost from 125 to just 50. This lowered the value even more from 50 to 25 per teleporter allowing you to build a sentry and the teleporters in the same full ammo pickup. The Eureka effect has stayed statistically unchanged since 2016. The Wrapped Assassin, added December 15, 2010. The Wrapped Assassin is a fun melee to run, but it isn't all that practical the majority of the time. It could be a great pair with something like the Flying Guillotine to do great loads of burst damage, but apart from that, it's just mediocre at best. C tier. Trivia. According to the description of the weapon, the bubble travels at a cool 90 miles per hour, but when actually converted from game speed into real measures of unit, it is closer to 128 miles per hour. Damn. The Wrapped Assassin has been mostly unchanged since it's released. The only things that have been changed was a splash effect was added, so if you slightly miss, you may be able to deal some chip damage. 
which is, I guess, better than nothing, though it still can't cause bleed and it doesn't do much. The recharge rate was decreased from 10 seconds to 7.5 seconds, 25%, which allows you to use the ornament more often. And finally, the base damage was increased by one whole damage, from an average of 11 to an average of 12. The reason I use the word average is because random damage spread was a big thing back in the day. I believe on the wiki it is listed at 10.5, but obviously you can't deal 10.5 damage in TF2, so just rounding it up to 11 most of the time. Currently, if you kill someone with the bubble directly, it will display the same icon as the Sandman on a direct kill. Though, there was a plan for it to have its own kill icon, and it looked like this. The only difference between this and the Sandman icon is, obviously, the object that's being hurled at the back of their head. And finally, if you hit someone at long range, about 1,408 hammer units, the bubble will crit. This is listed in the weapon stat description, but just in case you didn't know. The Wrench, added October 10th, 2007. The Wrench is simply baseline. It is my personal pick the vast majority of the time, unless I'm specifically playing Battle Engineer. Uh, you really can't go wrong with it. B tier. Trivia. Not specific to the wrench, but when TF2 was in its infancy, players were unable to level up buildings past level 1, with the exception of the sentry, so teleporters and dispensers. In addition, teleporters used to cost 125 metal to build, rather than 50. I guess this has more to do with the PDA, but uh, I'm not ranking the PDA, as there's only one PDA, right? So I'm just mentioning it here. Two. While it's not the default wrench itself, the wrench has two gold variants. The Australian wrench is the one most seen today, though for a while it was possible to craft a golden wrench, starting July 1st, 2010, preceding the engineer update. The gold wrench predates Australiums by about two years as well. The wrench was a little more piss yellow than the current Australiums, and it turned people gold, but overall it looked pretty cool. There's so much history about the Golden Ranch that it, this video would be an, unable to do it justice. I recommend you go watch a full video about the Golden Ranch after this video. It's full of controversies, dramas, and so much more. Super cool. Finally, unless I'm forgetting about one, this is the very last weapon of this two-part series. Thank God. The Yoritura Award, added September 30th, 2010. The Yoritu Reward is an interesting case. It isn't necessarily bad, but it's nearly pointless. The whole weapon revolves around disguising as a person you recently killed. The problem is, is it isn't 2007 anymore. People don't often fall for disguises, and either way, spy checking is a major part of the game and has no cost to the person doing the spy checking. The one feature that is useful with the Yoritu Reward, however, is the silent killer attribute. Often spies are caught because the person they just killed made a loud noise, causing everyone to turn around. And even if they personally didn't hear the loud noise, they would be able to see the body fall to the ground or look up at the kill feed and saw that a spy just killed somebody near them. The silent killer attribute removes these issues, so it can make chain stabbing a little bit easier if you're sneaky. Not bad, but not great. C tier. Trivia. Aladdin. You probably all heard this fact, but I'm gonna regurgitate it anyway because if I didn't include it, it'd just be doing this weapon a disservice. The name of the knife is a reference to the scene in the 1992 film Aladdin where Jafar fools Aladdin with the disguise and then attempts to murder him with a dagger that Jafar refers to as your eternal reward. What are you doing? Giving you your reward. Your eternal reward. Before the item was released, Robin Walker joked that the your eternal reward's drawback would be that it couldn't face stab. Also from the wiki. If you aren't aware, a face stab is an exploit slash bug with how TF2 works. Normally a backstab is required to instantly kill someone, so you have to be in the back portion of the 180 degrees out of the 360, if that makes any sense. Basically, you have to be in the back portion of them. Though there is a chance that if the server and client side don't match up, it could appear that you stab someone from the front yet get rewarded with a backstab. And the last piece of trivia for this video. This weapon has been unchanged besides some bug fixes for seven years, until it was finally given some new updates in 2017 during the Jungle Inferno update. The Eurotour Reward's original downside was that you couldn't disguise whatsoever. Though this was changed to non-kill that disguises require a full cloak meter, and it would consume the full cloak meter. 
However, if you still got a backstab, disguises were free. That didn't change. They also added an increased cloak drain of 33%, which I can remember being bugged at one point, but it never was statistically changed. That's it. That's the end of the video, wrapping up the nine year anniversary videos. Like I said, it was supposed to be one long video, but unfortunately my editing software had other plans. Turns out it only allows for two hour segments. I figured that out when I was doing the Sandman segment. This video took a very long time to make, no joke. I worked on these two videos for an average of four to six hours a day for the last month or so. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, I really do. I put my heart and soul into this one. I still can't believe it's been nearly a decade on YouTube. Not long in the grand scheme of things, but man, time flies. Nine years seem much further away. Anyway, with that all being said, have a great rest of your day, week, month, and year. I'll catch you guys later.